I've gotten great value from the B2B SaaS focused content library, from my circle group of small number of peers that meet every month, uh, and from the workshops that Alex organizes with top, top people. Um, if Alex was running acting workshops, he would have a how to cry in movies workshop and bring along his best pal, Tom Hanks. I mean, it really is quality people that he, that he organizes. Welcome to the SaaS for Revolution show. David Bennigson, CEO and co-founder of Signal AI. Welcome, David. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Great to see you again, Alex. Yeah, good to have you here. Good to see you again. We were just chatting before we were pressing record of you coming to SaaS Doc in Dublin. I think the first SaaS Doc that we had and uh, sort of, yeah, feeling a bit like nostalgic around that, uh, that event, but uh, looking, uh, looking forward to it coming back in October slightly bigger event this year it's going to be we're aiming for 5000 sas founders execs the first one that you were at was uh, was about 700 founders from 34 countries so we'll be looking at about 5000 from probably more than 80 countries for this one and yeah it definitely seems a real appetite to be back in person which uh, you you've in, in fact even just spoken back at your first in person conference today <laughs> how did that go yes yes exactly no it felt surreal being able to uh, get back on stage and actually present to an audience. It felt like a far cry, uh, you know, uh, remember to pack the, the clicker. Of course, one didn't need uh, during the last few years with all of these uh, Zoom events. But, but no, very much looking forward to, uh, to your next SAS stock and being able to meet back with the community in person. Um, as you were just saying, I was recalling the, the first one I attended and having this, you know, brilliant experience in, in what felt like a very kind of focused and an intimate setting. So, you know, relishing the opportunity to get back uh, together with the community and having these sorts of events again. Yeah, yeah, can't wait. It's going to be certainly my highlight of the year. And I, I hope, uh, you know, 4,999 other people's uh, highlights uh, uh, as well. But moving on from that, obviously great to have you, I think, you, you, you know, back here and uh, looking forward to doing this zero to 10 special with you charting your journey, you know, Signal AI's journey to 10 million ARR, which I think you're well north of at the moment. I mean, can you share where you're at at the moment? Yeah, well, we're certainly well north of 10 and we're well north of 20 now and, and on our way to getting north of 30. So it's yep. been, yeah, it's been an exciting few years uh, since founding the business and continuing to be exciting with the sort of growth that we're experiencing as a business. Very cool. Because I think in, in 2016, you were, I think, Series A, like Super yeah. Series A. Uh, and yeah, where, where are you now in terms of uh, what, what round of uh, venture capital have you raised? Yeah, so we, we founded the business about eight years ago now, and we've gone through various funding rounds. So we've raised over $100 million of, of venture capital to date. Uh, our last round, which we raised over the summer, was a $50 million round that was led by Highland Europe. And I guess, I forget with all the alphabet soup, but I think that was kind of series, series D stage, I guess you could call it series C, series D. Cool. Uh, just uh, good for, for framing the sort of context there. But so like, uh, before we get into it, I mean, the first thing, just like uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself as a person, uh, you know, who is David Benningson? And uh, yeah, let us get it to uh, know you a little bit. Yeah, no, with pleasure. I'll, I'll try and answer that uh, esoteric question. Who, <laughs> who am I? But, but uh, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm David. I'm the founder and CEO of, of Signal AI, which, as I mentioned, I started eight years ago with my co-founder, Dr. Miguel Martinez, who's an academic. He did his master's and his PhD in machine learning and, and AI. We founded the business in a garage, of course, which belongs to my parents in, in northwest London. Uh, so we're in good company there with some other organizations that were founded, startups that were founded in, in garages. And yeah, my, my background was actually uh, not from the world of, of technology. I, I studied law. I practiced it very briefly before realizing it wasn't the industry or sector I wanted to spend my career in. And, and randomly, I went to work for an entrepreneur, Jamie Oliver, the chef. And I worked for him for about two years. And I kind of got exposure at a fairly young age. I was, I was in my early 20s at the time to... Kind of what entrepreneurship meant he was an incredibly sort of buoyant uh, and exciting personality he was right at the height of his entrepreneurial you know powers at the time and you know i spent time working kind of closely with him and, and getting exposure 
to you know what it's like to be an entrepreneur and i kind of got the bug and then through a random confluence of events you know i'll give you the non-polished non-vc version i'll give you the, the, the sort of reality i ended up founding signal i mean the first data point really was actually that my parents have together run an executive search firm for about 30 years that they, they, they emigrated from South Africa, came to the country with nothing. And they built this, what at first was a recruitment firm and then ultimately an executive search firm. And for about 15 years, they had sent out this manually curated daily newsletter to senior executives around the country, but they're complete technophobes. My, my parents being born, you know, well before the, the, the age of the internet. So one weekend I helped them move this newsletter onto an email service provider. So for the first time after about 15 years, they had statistics of, you know, who was reading it and how much it was being open and engaged with. And I was kind of blown away. It went to about 30,000 people. And when I read who was receiving it on a daily basis, it was some of the most senior and important business executives in the country. You know, the, the chairman of Marks and Spencer, the CEO of Tesco, uh, the chairman of Burberry, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of was surprised. I was like, why are some of the most powerful and important business people in the country relying and reading this daily newsletter put together by a very junior analyst at a small executive search firm? You know, why are they relying on this manually generated newsletter? So I went and spoke to 25 of them. I asked if I could go and chat to 25 of them. And I ended up speaking to 25 kind of top CEOs of FTSE 250 uh, companies. And I found out that despite organizations and business leaders never having had more access to data and information than ever before, never finding it harder to use this vast deluge of data that exists outside of their organization to drive better decision making within their businesses. I also found out and, and could see that that businesses were facing, you know, more complex issues than ever before, that the world had just become, you know, more dynamic, you know, more complex uh, and more disrupted than ever before. And of course, the last two years have, have exemplified that. But it's not just the pandemic. I mean, it's the, the rise of ESG, it's the climate crisis, it's race and inequality issues, it's the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. Businesses are having to kind of take a position and understand their environment. And they can't just focus on their customers and their employees anymore like perhaps they would have done in the past. But when you ask these business leaders how they navigate these issues, you know, they don't have effective radar to do so. So that was the sort of second data point. And then the third data point was meeting my co-founder who I spammed on meetup.com. I started going to kind of machine learning. This was eight years ago, machine learning and AI meetups in, you know, random basements in central London. And there'd be sort of eight PhD machine learning experts. And then me trying to tell them about this weird random idea I had for a business. And through that, I met a professor, a guy called Udo Krauschwitz, and he introduced me to uh, what then became my co-founder, Miguel. And I told him I had this, you know, well-funded startup in a, in a beautiful office, which actually was a, a no-funded startup in a windowless garage in Chalk Farm. Um, and he met me. And that was the third piece of the puzzle, because in order to solve those challenges of information overload and building radar to understand your environment, we believed you know, very quickly that the use of AI was a solution to those problems. And our thesis was that if we could aggregate the world's information and pull that into a single platform and then apply machine learning and AI to that data, we would be able to unlock a set of insights that help business leaders get ahead of risks, issues, threats faster and more efficiently, and ultimately transform the way they make decisions for their business. Great story there. And uh, great insights into how you met your co-founder, because I, I was thinking, I was going to ask you that question. Uh, shows the power of events, big and small, uh, in doing that. And, and I, I actually get surprised sometimes. I, I don't know why. Maybe it is quite uh, pretty common. But the amount of founders that we've had on the podcast who said that, hey, you know, either they've met their co-founder at Sastock or you know other conferences and events, and you know, ideas and you, you know, companies are born, you know, at, at these events. So it's one of these things that sometimes you see there, there are like different services or different ways of people looking for co-founders and. A lesson here that, you know, by going to relevant meetups about the topic that you're interested in, you know, you're going to find like minded people. Right. And uh, and, and the rest is history. So, so you met your co-founder. How long did it take to get like an MVP then in place from this meeting with the co-founder to yeah, what was what was the time scale to having an MVP for Signal AO? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. And when I think back to that first kind of year year and a half, it, it feels like a bit of a blur because in some ways, I mean, we were starting from literally nothing. So, so how we kind of got things off the ground there always surprises me and uh, kind of impresses. I'm getting impressed with myself almost that we managed to survive that first 18 months 
with sort of so little. But actually, one of the big galvanizing things that happened was we applied for an Innovate UK grant where Innovate UK, which they still do, fund the sort of intersection between academia and commercial uh, practice. So what we ended, we applied for a grant and we were awarded a grant for a few hundred thousand pounds, which gave us our first kind of seed capsule along with a little bit of family and friends money. And that was the first kind of initial sort of uh, impetus and resources that we required to sort of build that initial MVP. I remember our first MVP before we even had a user interface, Miguel created an algorithm that could classify news documents as belonging to particular topics or themes. So the idea was we, we bought in a feed of news, we aggregated this data, and we wanted to figure out whether we could use technology like a human analyst to figure out whether it belonged to a particular topic or, or issue, etc. So we didn't have a user interface. So somehow our, our CTO, Wes at the time, managed to connect uh, this data feed and this algorithm to, to the printer that we had in the garage. And what we did was we printed out pieces of paper. We trained the algorithm to be able to spot articles that were about executive moving job or M&A or IPO. And then we had to print out pieces of paper from the printer to see whether the articles actually matched the classification algorithm that we built. And that was our first product. Obviously, we can sell that or, or show it to anyone. But I remember this first kind of a hard moment when out of the printer would come in these pieces of paper and they were actually uh, relevant to the topics and concepts that we trained. And I, uh, I remember thinking, gosh, okay, maybe it was a good idea that I quit my job and uh, started this random company in a garage. This tech actually actually worked. But from there, we kind of built that initial infrastructure and we built the first sort of user interface and MVP. And I think that probably took us somewhere in the region of six to 12 months, you know, because this is quite fundamentally complex uh, technology that we're, we're building. Uh, and, and from an infrastructure and, and operational standpoint, te te technology wise, uh, is also fairly, in, you know, uh, significant. I mean, from the almost the get go, we were aggregating initially hundreds of thousands of documents a day, and then almost millions of documents a day quite quickly, and processing that data in real time to then analyze it. And then from there, we started to try and find our first customers. And, you know, initially, it was just an absolute kind of crapshoot, we would sell to you know, anyone or, or everyone who was willing to buy. And so we had this kind of random smorgasbord of different sorts of clients. We had a fashion trend forecasting business who wanted to use the data to figure out where fashion might be heading. We had a, a, a policy think tank who wanted to use the data to understand emerging political trends and policy trends. And then, you know, I remember we had our this Wolf of Wall Street character who came from a sort of hedge fund background and he was actually our first paying customer and he wanted to use the technology to try and figure out sentiment of stocks or companies and i remember him saying to us you know you know we, i want to sign up i believe that this technology is going to help me make more money you know make better trades how much does it cost and and i said oh well i, I better phone you back later today and i'll come back with a pricing proposal so we sat in a circle myself uh, Miguel, our chief data scientist, and where's our CTO? And we said, you know, how much should we charge? We didn't have a clue. So, so Miguel said, uh, we should charge a thousand pounds a month. And where's our CTO said, no, no, that's far too cheap. We should charge 3000 pounds a month. So I phoned up this Wolf of Wall Street character and I said, no, we're charging 15,000 pounds a month. And he said, fine, I'll sign up for 12 months. And I put the phone and I said, crap, we should have charged him 30,000 pounds a month instead. So <laughs> we really were <laughs> figuring it out as we went along, uh, as yeah. we do. Um, but slowly but surely, we started to find, you know, that sort of focus on product market fit. We started to think about the sort of beachheads that we wanted to penetrate. And I remember, you know, rereading Crossing the Chasm, which, of course, is a very influential book about, you know, building and growing markets, uh, particularly with areas of, of new innovation and thinking, OK, if we're really going to scale the business, we're going to have to focus in on a specific type of user and buyer persona and really kind of narrow down. And from there, we can build a beachhead and then grow fr from that. So we started to, to zone in and, and that's where we started to find that early phase of repeatability and, and a commercial model that could scale essentially. So how long did it take to get to product market fit? And I guess you've been, some of the, the things that you did was, you, you know, focusing on specific personas, uh, I guess kind of that focus kind of helping you get there. Like what else did you do to get to product market fit? And I guess the first bit, like how long and, and what did you do to get there? 
Yeah, I can't exactly. I, I, product market fit is always that amorphous. You know, there's no single metric or, or single sort of aha moment. I, in my experience, at least, it was a it was a sort of graduating and, and sometimes even moving target. And we, we felt that we continuously had to go back to that definition of ideal customer profile, because I think it, it starts with being able to be very, very crisp and very clear about your ideal customer profile and getting it down almost to the granular level. It's, you know, what industries are you targeting? What buyer persona are you targeting? What level in the organization are you targeting? And what problem is, are you solving for that buyer? And then zoning, you know, a lot of your energy and effort all the while, because our long-term vision is to build a horizontal platform and to solve a multitude of different use cases. And today as a much more mature business, we do that very successfully. But we, we knew that back then we had limited resource and limited bandwidth. And so we had to be very, very sort of targeted in, in the sort of uh, kind of nexus of those different uh, abilities to segment the, the market. And so that probably took us, I want to say at least two, maybe two and a half years to get to that sort of place where we had a really refined value proposition for that particular user and that particular buyer. And also I think the other dynamic, you know, the flip side of the coin was that whilst we were bringing a, a new capability that was very differentiated because of the technology and the diversity of the data that we ingest in our platform, but we are selling, we were selling and continue to sell into what is a very legacy incumbent market. I mean, there are some massive global organizations who operate in our space, you know, from Bloomberg, to Dow Jones, to Thomson Reuters, to LexisNexis. These are, you know, multi-billion dollar organizations who have already, you know, got a lot of the, the captive demand and, and existing relationships within the market. So at times it's a display sale. At other times it's Greenfield and it's, and it's a new sale. But in the display sale, what you, have, what you quickly realize is that it's not just good enough to be differentiated. You also have to be enterprise sufficient. So you have to pass through compliance and procurement and you have to be buyable from large companies, particularly if you're selling in B2B enterprise SaaS. So, so we, you know, had to go through not only that journey of focus, but also that sort of kind of operational and infrastructure build out of our offering to ensure that we were buyable by large companies who have quite a high barrier to entry. When did you raise that, like, say, first round of like institutional VC capital? Was it, was it a pre-seed or a seed? And with whom and how did you do it? Yeah, no. So because we had gotten that initial academic sort of grant, that was essentially our pre-seed funding. So our first yeah. kind of, uh, institutional round was probably 18 months into the business. It was it was at some point kind of late 2014, early 2015. And we basically were engaged with, uh, you know, at the time, it's really interesting. The funding market has changed dramatically in these seven, eight years. You know, back then, seed funds focusing on B2B SaaS you know, with a with a with a natural competency in that area, I could probably count them on one hand, maybe two. You know, since then there's just been this explosion uh, in terms of the number and the variety and the capabilities of the, of the venture funds in the in the UK community, and it's been amazing to see the sort of the 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 environment kind of mature and grow. But back then we probably spoke to ten to twenty funds because that was probably it. And we were very fortunate that we, you know, we got a fairly competitive process going and we ended up with a number of different term sheets. And I remember actually, so the, the fund that led our round was Frontline Ventures. And we were one of their first investments. I mean, it gives you a sense. I think we were one of their first investment, maybe the third or fourth investment from their first ever fund. Frontline had become a quite established B2B SaaS focused fund, of course, uh, mm -hmm. with a presence in Ireland. Um, so I'm sure you know those guys well. And we had them plus we had two or three other term sheets offered. And I remember that one of the offers that we got from a competing investor was significantly better on the valuation. It was probably 20% better in terms of the valuation. But we didn't have the same sort of cultural connection and we didn't see the same sort of strategic value as we did with, with the frontline team, with Will McQuillan particularly, who we really liked and thought very highly of. And then we heard, you know, that we heard a few rumors about one of these other funds that maybe they weren't as good a kind of corporate citizen, board citizen as, as another portfolio company of theirs had hoped. And so, but it was a, such a material difference in the valuation that we debated it, I remember, for hours. And in the end, what we did, the only way we could decide was we said, we've got to stop debating. We all should write the name of the fund that we want to, we think is the best fit 
privately and you know secretly and then we'll all turn it over at the same time and if we're all in agreement we'll go with that basically what it will be majority rules and so we all wrote on these scraps of paper who we thought we should go with and everyone turned over and, and it was frontline ventures and i think in retrospect choosing that offer which was not as good on the valuation you know paid off you know many times over they were a great early partner for us continue to be a great partner for us very very supportive of the business you know strategically value add and just i think probably most importantly for that sort of early stage investor choice you know a good culture fit people that we trust you know people that we feel aligned with and you know i think that trumps almost all the other capabilities or value that an investor can bring do you have that sense of you know trying to achieve the same thing and go about you know achieving those things in in the same way and do you have that sort of cultural alignment so um i remember you know i feel very vindicated actually by that by that choice thinking back now yeah great story and a very important lesson like beyond the money you, you know thinking about the culture and working with the vc and the value add right outside of the money and the valuation is a very important uh, uh, decision we've seen you know i've seen i'm sure you have seen you know read and heard about quite a few vcs and founder relationships not necessarily working out you, you know well and then you, you know potentially you, you know founders and ceos of, you, you know of companies being moved out of the business um you know because of uh, uh, the mismatch there uh, in, in the cultural fit um but mo moving on from that can you tell us like, or highlight maybe some of the challenges that you had to overcome from zero to one million? Uh, and then the same question from zero to 10. Yeah, great question. Difficult to answer because there were so many. I mean, I think zero to one is probably the, you know, as the, as the book outlines, of course, famously, is, 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 is probably the hardest and also in many ways the most rewarding, you know, part of that journey because it is just so challenging and you have so much against you. I mean, I think that point we were talking about before, that idea of crossing the chasm of focus and of, you know, finding that product market fit, I would say is probably the biggest challenge that you have. And also achieving that product market fit and focusing on that uh, beachhead to cross the chasm with limited resource, it makes it that much harder. I think back then, you know, when you're on zero to one, you know, everyone is doing everything. So in a way, the sort of ability to be aligned and to work together very closely and to have that sort of cultural alignment is fairly easy and implicit. I think the bigger challenge you get when you go from one to 10, you still have many of those challenges around focus, around resource constraint, but then you have that additional challenge as the business grows, which is that actually you're not, you know, five, six, eight people in a garage anymore, you're 10, you're 20, you're 30, and then you hit these sort of dumbbell moments like 50 people where actually it becomes much, much harder to ensure everyone is focused and aligned on the, on the same objectives, um, that you have the sort of cultural understanding of how to work well with each other. And that's where it becomes important to start building the right sort of processes, to start defining your values and embedding them within the organization effectively, to start ensuring that you are hiring people who exemplify those values and demonstrate the right sort of behaviors and start implementing some form of operating model, whether it's OKRs or 4DX or, or, or any of the above uh, that are used to try and help ensure that there is that sort of integration and alignment across different parts of your business uh, to focus on the right things and achieve those goals. What are sort of maybe like three sort of key steps that you've taken or the business has taken to enable you to get to uh, 10 million ARR outside of maybe some of the, the, the stuff that you sort of mentioned? Yeah, I think probably the, one of the biggest is the definition of that ideal customer profile and continuously going back to that ideal customer profile and ensuring that your organization is aligned around that ideal customer profile and that you're putting, and that could change and evolve and extend over time, but that sort of clarity around that definition and the ability to focus in on that particular buyer persona and the problem you're solving for them, I think is absolutely critical. I think second is finding the right commercial model and, and sort of go to market engine that is, you know, commensurate with the profile that you're focused on. So of course there's that, you know, very famous, I think 0.9 capital blog post on, you know, what animal you're hunting, you know, which has probably been around for 10 years, but I yep. think, you know, so many companies I meet at an early stage still seem to lack that clarity on what animal they're hunting 
what size deals they're going after and therefore what commercial go to market model makes most sense for their business and who you hire, how you set them up, whether you use SDRs, whether you're more inbound versus outbound, building that commercial engine is so critical to get right because it's the most costly part of your business that you're going to build probably. Uh, and it's where so many mistakes uh, get made. And it's also where so many lagging indicators exist. So often if you're, if you're off the mark on your go to market engine, you're not going to find out for six months and you know, that can start burning through your runway really significantly. So I'd say ideal customer profile, really defining your go to market and commercial strategy effectively. And then of course it's, it's cliche, but it's team, you know, and it's the individuals that you bring into the organization. I over time have, you know, realized through experience that basically whenever there was an issue or a function or a part of the organization that was not working effectively, it came down to the individual leading that particular function. It used to take me a lot longer to diagnose that and then make it, you know, take action against it. And, you know, as a founder and a CEO who cares about my culture and cares about the people in the organization, I used to think, you know, making changes at a leadership level was somehow in conflict with me building a great corporate environment. And again, one of the big lessons I've learned is actually for the company, for the function, and even for the individual where you might need to make a change, the sooner you do it and the more forthright you are about it, the more effective it is for all parties involved. And often it actually enables that individual to go on and do other things in their career in the right sort of environment that's the right fit for them. Because if it's not working for you it's, and the company, it's probably not working for them as well. So I'd say those three things, sort of ideal customer profile, right commercial model, and then having the right team and leadership in place and being sort of decisive and uh, assertive and forthright when things aren't working are probably the three biggest areas that I've learned if I was going to, you know, rerun this all over again, that I would, I would probably do faster and more efficiently. Obviously you learn on the job, but like, but um, how have you learned to be a good CEO? Like what things have you kind of really put in place and to, yeah, I, I guess be the best CEO that you can be? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think as a first time founder and CEO and, 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 you know, relatively inexperienced and young when I started the company, I've had to definitely accelerate my learning in a number of different ways. I think one thing that's been absolutely transformational for me is I've had executive coaching since I started the business and I've got a you know fantastic executive coach who I know coaches other tech CEOs and, and scale up CEOs and that sort of ability I meet with uh, and have met with him weekly for about seven years. And so that's every week for an hour, I go into a sort of safe space with someone who helps me think through challenges, issues, opportunities through the business, but it's totally objective that they're, they're there to sort of, you know, coach me, not coach the company and they don't have skin in the game. And also enables me to be very reflective because I think as a business grows and scales, in my opinion, IQ becomes less and less important as a, as a leader and EQ becomes more and more important. And so EQ is about managing people effectively. It's about communication skills. It's about managing conflict. It's about galvanizing teams. It's about setting a vision that people feel inspired to follow. It's about, you know, building the right set of values and culture. And that's where coaching, I think, has been so powerful for me to kind of continue to hone and develop my EQ skills. Alongside that, I think team is, is critical and I've never been shy and been very sort of conscious about trying to find people more experienced, more knowledgeable, more tenured than I am and surround myself with great experienced senior folks or junior folks who are great and, and high quality because I think that makes you feel better. And there's, you know, I know that's probably an obvious thing to say, but I think sometimes ego gets in the way of hiring the best people. And I'm totally egoless because I think, you know, the greater the people I have around me, the better it reflects on me. And then over time, I've also started to use the board as an instrument as the business has grown. You know, for the first few years, we didn't have a board and I don't think a board is needed in those first few years of a business, probably before series A at the, at the least. But after that, as the business starts to grow, I think a board can be very effective if used in the right way. I think you've got to use it as a sort of instrument for sort of strategic insight and, and, as, and as a partnership, not as a sort of reporting board where you feel the obligation of having to go and present your numbers and let them mark your homework. But I think we've worked very hard with the board 
to create a sort of environment where actually everyone is on an even keel and it's all about helping us solve the problems for the business and and and, and go after specific opportunities and then more recently have added sort of non-exec representation to the board because i think investor directors and the vcs you know they're, they're very smart they have a lot of very good pattern recognition they can bring a lot of sort of aggregate insight from what they're seeing across portfolio and the market but they're typically not operators and they're typically not sort of entrepreneurs and company builders many of them have never worked in um in in startups before and so we brought in a sort of diverse mix of real operational experience which has really added to the quality of the conversations uh, that we have at the board so my chairman Today is a chap called Archie Norman, who's the currently is the chairman of Marks and Spencer, was the chairman of Lazard, chairman of ITV, chairman of ASDA, many other major corporations. And so he brings this sort of huge knowledge of the industry, of the sort of customer, of how to run a board effectively, of how to build a great business with a great culture. And then we've also added Sarah Wood as a non-exec director, who was the founder of Unruly Media, and she scaled that business uh, as CEO and then sold it to News Corp uh, successfully. So she's really seen the gambit all the way through to exit and brings a lot of that sort of scale up and operational experience. So I think that adding those sorts of non-financial perspectives to the board conversation has also been a great way for me to learn and get exposure to, you know, you know really exp great experienced people who know how to build great companies. If you could go back to when you, you mentioned, obviously you're a first time founder, like, like myself and like many listening, but if you could go back in time to when you started the business, from what you know now, what advice would you give yourself? Gosh, good question. I think I would go back to those three areas, certainly, that I mentioned before, and I would sort of drive a much more aggressive focus and rigor into those areas sooner. And I would probably inject as much confidence in my in the earlier version of myself to focus on those areas and to have the sort of self belief that sometimes when you're you know your instincts are very powerful and perhaps when someone is not quite working out that you'd hope it was going to work out to sort of follow those instincts and and lean in sooner because i think you know wasted time in in this sort of environment where there's so much pressure to go fast and scale quickly i think that sort of additional confidence would have been very helpful I think the one other additional point I'd add to those three is, you know, my, I'm, I'm more commercially focused and product focused naturally as a person. I don't necessarily lean in historically, haven't necessarily lent in on the financial side of the business. And I think if I was, and we never necessarily, you know, hired a CFO early in the business's life cycle. And that's probably one area I would have built more muscle in slightly earlier. Again, in the first few years, probably not necessary. But as you start raising venture capital, I think it's too easy in today's environment to just think that you can raise out of, you know, you can just raise at, at nauseam. And I think this topic of efficiency and sort of prudent management of cash and of burn to complement fantastic growth, I personally feel is going to be increasingly important. And even if the funding market, which it has continued to be, is absolutely crazy, I think the best businesses can balance fantastic growth with building a really efficient and solid business model that sits underneath that. And so again, again, we built a very strong finance team in recent years and kind of backbone into the business. I may have done that a little bit earlier and started thinking about those sorts of topics like efficiency slightly sooner within the business, because I think we have a little bit of an echo chamber within the sort of venture back community that, you know, growth is, uh, sorry, that the, the funding and capital is this sort of never depleted tap. And actually, you know, in the last few weeks, we've seen the markets taking a slightly, a bit of a dip. Businesses that raised, a, you know, eye-watering valuations last year, if they don't have, you know, solid business models, if they aren't able to combine the growth with the efficiency, well, we've already seen a few examples in the last few weeks. Hopin is a, is a good one, right? That, yeah. that I think has had some real trouble, unfortunately, because perhaps a little bit too, too much too soon, basically. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Final question here. Uh, so are there any resources that have helped you or that you would recommend for founders on this journey, in the particular the, the journey from zero to 10? Well, I think for any founder, as I mentioned before, I would strongly recommend getting an executive coach. And if anyone on your listenership wants a recommendation, please feel free to, to get my contact details and, 
which I can share at the end if you like, and very happy to make recommendations. I'm sure there are others out there that I'm, that I'm unaware of, but I, I would, I, you know, for me, that has been a secret weapon that I mm -hmm. felt has been incredibly transformational for me on a personal level. And I think it's helped me in my business life. I think it's also helped me in my personal life as well. So would strongly recommend that. One of the things we did early days was build an advisory board. I think advisory boards can be a little bit, they can be smirked at sometimes, or people can be cynical about them. But we built, a, again, another advisory board of operators, ex-entrepreneurs, people from industry, not investors, who could help us with more operational challenges. And that's been you know, very useful and transformational for us as a business. And a lot of people in the industry want to help. And a lot of people in corporate industry want to help startups and get exposure to startups. So don't lose sight of the sort of currency you have as a founder of a high growth technology startup that people you think might not be interested in helping you potentially very much are, you know, there's just a lot of interest in this, in this area. And then of course, I mentioned a couple of the sort of influential books and materials that I've read. I think, you know, three that spring to mind, definitely sort of the crossing the chasm was very formative for me in terms of the early stage in that zero to $1 million sprint. We use an operating model called four disciplines of execution, uh, 4DX. It's a, another version of the sort of OKR type framework. I think it creates significant alignment and focus in the business and enables you to really zone in on one wildly important goal and then set the organization up to be focused and aligned around achieving that goal. And so I think that's a great operating uh, model. And then, you know, there's never split the difference because that's a great negotiation book. And I think a big part of being a founder and a, and a CEO of an early stage business is negotiation across a whole range of different activities you do. So I strongly recommend that one as well. Great recommendations. I still actually haven't read Never Split the Difference. I need to get it on the list and it comes up uh, time and again. So uh, uh, I, I need to look at that uh, and, and get that one done. Well, look, Dave, uh, you mentioned like, really appreciate you sharing all these lessons and learnings and, and being open and transparent there. Where can people find you online if they wanted to reach out and take you up on the offer of recommendations for executive coach? How can people contact you? Yes, I mean, I'm easily found on LinkedIn and respond there. So, so if, you, if you look me up on LinkedIn, David Benningson and Signal AI, uh, I will be sure to respond there. I'm on Twitter. And then very happy to share my email details, if you like, Alex, and you can add them to the, the podcast details as well, if you, if you want. Awesome. Well, great stuff. Well, thanks so much, David, for being a great uh, guest on today's SaaS Revolution show, Zero to Ten Special. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you in person later in the year. Uh, and thanks once again, David Benningson, uh, CEO, co-founder of Signal AI. Thank you. Cheers, Alex.